Can you guys see? I'm doing the thing. It's uh, the the Gaston thing from Beauty and the Beast. I don't like have my eyebrow up, and I'm not uh, because uh, you know that's uh, looks ridiculous. And uh, I think I don't quite have that much control over my eyebrows. But oh, that is a really weird pose. Like what's that? <laughs> I guess just weird cartoon versions of men. Uh, and hey. There's the topic. Um, all right, so I have wanted to talk about masculinity for a while. Um, so I came on here to do just that. Uh, this is a quick vlog straight off the dome. Uh, if you wanna see some of my ideas on this in a slightly outdated, uh, but more, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, but slightly more um, refined sense look at the link in the description uh there is a video uh or i'm sorry this is the video there is an essay that i wrote several years ago entitled why the alt-right failed masculinity so you know it's a little outdated but a lot of the ideas that are in this video are also going to be in that essay but i'm also going to be expanding upon a lot of things so um anyway yeah so i'm up here doing this stream and um what i sort of wanted to talk about was the state of modern masculinity um and how that applies to the world and to these reacts that have kind of spawned around so mras meninists all those kinds of uh folks and uh what exactly is going on with them and uh their attempts at resurrecting traditional masculine archetypes now you know here's the thing um I've like not the most manly man in the world and almost no one is, but also, you know, I've done a lot of the big manly things. I lived in the woods for six months, hiking the Appalachian Trail, Maine to Georgia. I'm a black belt in karate. I literally knocked people out with my bare hands, actually my knee. <laughs> I've also gotten my butt kicked on a number of occasions. Uh, you know, I'm married and have given birth, I've passed on my, my line to a masculine child. Um, and so this really has me thinking a lot about masculinity and how we as a society talk about it and like what it even is. Um, I'm going to probably be brushing a little bit on uh, trans issues also in this. Um, I am not trans. I'm not part of that community. So I will probably say something stupid at one point or another. You know, I'm a white cis guy. Uh, however, I am also somebody who throughout most of his life, the world has tried to put him into a box uh, in one way or another. And I just, I have this very visceral reaction when uh, somebody tries to tell somebody else how to behave in public in a uh, negative way that doesn't really express their soul. So um, while I am not trans, uh, I definitely have a lot of affection uh, for trans people and compassion for what they're going through. Um, so let's talk a little bit about masculinity, what it is and uh, why the far right kind of sucks at it, just sucks at it hard. And I, I really want to point that out because you've got to look at like a lot of the commentators that they have. Who, who do you have? You've got uh, Ben Shapiro. <laughs> I mean, the idea of Ben Shapiro as like a rat. Uh, ben Shapiro. <laughs> I mean, the idea of Ben Shapiro as like a real man, the dude's a total freaking weenie. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, beyond like Ben Shapiro, you've got, uh, who, who else do we have? We've got like Jordan Peterson, who kind of postures as everybody's dad, but, you know, he kind of more or less comes across, in my opinion, like the guy who wants to be the cool substitute teacher that comes in and like, will use a mild swear word and everybody's like, whoa. <laughs> um, and then, you know, like going further back, you've got like Donald Trump, who is genuinely one of the worst possible uh, depictions of masculinity that I've ever seen. Like, look up the, the photo that they have with him and his weird mutant family where they're like, uh, it's like their first day of standing lessons. Um, Trump knows how to frame himself in like a suit and to kind of, in certain lights, look like really masculine, but he's got like the same problem that Mussolini had, where Mussolini had this like jutting square jawline, uh, but like he never really managed to look anything uh, like anything other than like Aleister Crowley's basic cousin or like Marlon Brando after Marlon Brando let himself go. Um, when you look at this, this is like a, a pattern, like Richard Spencer, 
he's like almost on the edge of mincing and um what's his uh, you know and geez that haircut it's like we would have d- dismissed a guy like richard spencer in like late high school and college as one of those dudes who was like trying to be like super metrosexual try to uh, attract a, a, a girl and like it never worked because everybody knew they were just trying way too hard <laughs> so but even like somebody like uh take for instance the golden one the golden one's like a freaking weirdo bodybuilder but even that he's kind of like a weirdo preening bodybuilder and it, 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 every time like even when they try to connect with like a traditional masculine archetype they fall short um hitler <laughs> hitler or even or, or francisco franco dude looked like a short pudgy doofus both of them were and like francisco franco consistently looked like somebody's like um you know angry school teacher <laughs> so you know, you've got these guys who go out there and they, they like try to force back onto society like real masculinity and they just jam it in there like a freaking square peg in a round hole and they fail. They fail so hard. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think this has a lot to do with, uh, well, one, they're trying too hard and two, like they don't fit in. If you become a political reactionary usually going into becoming a radical um there's something wrong with your life in a lot of ways um or at least wrong with the world around it i i can definitely attest to that um i've got my own issues as an artist uh trying to you know uh eke out a living and so you know i'm not saying it's necessarily bad to not fit in because i don't fit in i think it's good when people don't fit in but like not fitting in in a very specific way where you then go and try to force everyone to conform to an ideal is just really weird and it attracts a very specific kind of person like there's no such thing as alpha males and beta males i was like based off of a fake study of wolves um, that its own author has constantly been running around going, no, I didn't know what I'm talking about. Get rid of this. Stop listening to the study. But like, it, it was not enough. Like people still like latched onto it because it was such a good story and uh, because it was convenient for the way that a lot of people wanted to view themselves. So, you know, when we look at like the traditional ideal of the, like the masculine man throughout history, like really like, the masculine man, like a real man, was always an atlas holding people up on his shoulders. He didn't start pointless fights because that was a waste of his energy and could wind up endangering him and his family. Um, and, you know, even with with regard to like a large patriarchal society, I mean, a lot of these guys on the alt-right kind of like they'll talk about how they want to return to patriarchy. Dude, like in patriarchy, it would be like one guy running a family especially if it's like catholic and they can't do anything with regard to birth control running a family of like 15 people dies young uh, completely overcome with stress like brutal alcoholic and you want that that's the society you want like it, it makes no sense um there's a lot about traditional masculine ideals that i like like i personally think that i i'm happy with being a man like, I, I feel like I fit into that pretty well. Um, I have done the great deeds that, you know, we're all supposed to do. Um, and, uh, you know, I've done other stuff that doesn't fit with that because screw conforming with what somebody else thinks about what a, what a man is and what a man should be. Um, there's definitely also, like, a lot of really crappy stuff about masculinity. Like, there's some great ideals. Um, one of the things that I really love uh, about being a man and about, like, a man's role in society is I love the fact that I am able to provide for my family. Like, my wife doesn't work right now, and uh, I, it would be fine if she did. She worked for a number of years, but since my son was born, uh, I've had to take on that burden. And it was something that I'd worried about for years and years because I became an artist and... You know, as an artist in the society, we tend to not have particularly uh, good uh, financial um, uh, prospects. She's like super famous. And, um, you know, unfortunately, in American society, if you don't do well, if you're not the market man, like, you know, with regard to finances, well, 
you know, you're not going to be able to acquire those resources, or at least it will be much more difficult. So one of the things that I have been very proud of that's made me feel like a real man, like more than climbing mountains and beating, uh, beating up opponents in karate and knocking people out and, you know, disappearing into the wilderness. Um, what has really made me feel like a, a real man is the ability to take care of a family as the sole caretaker. Now, again, this is not something that has to be this way. If my wife made more money than me and wanted to go off and do it and have me be the stay at home parent, I would be so happy to do that and to spend uh, as much time as possible with my son. Um, one of the things that I remember actually from being very young and one of the reasons why I chose to be an artist and to kind of avoid like the, the traditional career path is I saw my father uh, you know, working long hours. And I really resented that as a kid. Um, it, it looked like it wasn't his favorite thing to do. Like my dad's a doc and he's a very good doctor, makes a very good living. But I often get the uh, impression he might be happier, like running a mom and pop grocery store or something, you know. Um, so it, it got drilled into me from a very young age, like laboring in the way that society expects a man to labor is a terrible way to live. Um, and so now, you know, where I'm the one who is now going away from my son to go to work, um, to, you know, be a leader, uh, to, to, to provide these resources, um, you know, it, it's very odd to be on the opposite end of that uh, dynamic. Um, and, you know, I really hope that uh, as he grows, um, you know, he will have the time with me that maybe I didn't have with my father when I was very, very young. Um, and I, I look forward to it. And, you know, you can call it patriarchy. You can call it the male disease. You can call it toxic masculinity. I mean, it really, I don't care what you call it. Like George Carlin was talking about this stuff like back in like the 70s and 80s. There's a great video, like just Google it, like the male disease, uh, where he talks about how uh, masculinity and ideas about this actually hurt men, um, where we get sucked into like the machinery culture with cars or the military culture or the... Um, uh, you know, the drugs and alcohol culture and all these times we're going and trying to prove that we're real men to each other because, you know, you get raised on the playground and, you know, kids are jerks and they'll, uh, you know, suddenly like you're a kid, suddenly it's a bad thing to be a girl, but a good thing to be a man. Eh, it's all bullshit. Um, so, but what really gets me about these reactionaries is, is that they're, they like to present themselves like they are resurrecting masculinity and resurrecting this masculine ideal uh, that has somehow been lost. Um, you know, you almost see it like with, um, oh geez, Frank Miller. Um, in his comic, Sin City, they talk about Marv. And he has this like, uh, the Marv character is about one of the most masculine characters you can write. Like, I remember, um, like, because he's, he's, he's huge, he's brutal, he's ugly, he's still a good guy, you know, um, but, like, if you just, just jack up the testosterone, you essentially get Marv, and um, it, it almost reminds me, he's like a co comic character version of, um, like, if you've ever done one of those things where you put yourself through, like, your face and it will feminize your face or masculinize your face. So they'll be like, what would you look like as the other gender? I went uh, and, like, <laughs> I put my face in and I said, I'm a woman. Make me a man. <laughs> and so it redid it and made me more masculine. And then I took that face and I'm like, make me a man. I'm a woman. <laughs> and then a third time I was like, man, man, man. And the picture, uh, I'll... <laughs> I'll share it on Facebook or something. I shared it like I looked like the most boil covered hairy monster that you have ever seen. And any of you, if you get a chance to get a hold of one of those programs, just just keep pushing yourself towards one gender or another and you will it, it looks nuts. I highly recommend it. Um, but anyway, what are we really like talking about when we talk about gender, when we talk about masculinity? Um, we're talking about ideals. And the thing about ideals is ideals exist in the mind. 
they do not exist in reality because the benefit of an ideal in the mind is that it doesn't have to conform to the rules of reality. And one of the rules of reality is, is that nothing is perfect. Uh, no matter what you look at, every single thing is flawed and has within itself its own contradiction. You will never find a single perfect thing in all of creation, and thus you will never find a single perfect man. A man who like embodies all of the possible traits of masculinity. It doesn't exist. You know, like maybe in some abstract realm of, of forms that like Plato talked about, which if that exists, which I don't think it does, I think it's just something he made up. Um, uh, maybe, but in actual reality, nothing, no ideal actually exists. Uh, a good example of this might be, think of a circle, like a perfect circle. Now, we can imagine a circle and its perfect circliness and all of the, the just perfect, you know, you can give the mathematical equation for a perfect circle, but then try to draw a perfect circle or find it in nature, or a perfect square, or a perfect triangle. I guarantee you that no matter how careful and exacting you are, no matter what computer you use to uh, you know, generate it, once you take that ideal of the circle and take it from out of uh, the realm of the mind and into physical, material reality, no matter what, there will be a flaw there, and it will not be a perfect circle, or a perfect square, or a perfect triangle. What we what you get to is you get to the point where you say, oh, good enough. That's a circle. And similarly, that's how we need to think about men and women, masculinity and femininity. Like these are ideals. No one is 100% a woman and no one is 100% a man. Um, and all of us exist somewhere on this spectrum of masculinity and femininity. Um, and so while we are talking about that, you know, we have to recognize that, you know, again, our, our bodies are not perfect because they cannot live up to this abstract idea in the mind that doesn't really exist and never existed. Um, and so this is sort of like what, where we get into the idea of like gender and gender nonconformity and um, uh, what gender actually is and what it means because people will say, oh, you're, you were born a man, you have a penis, you, you, you have more testosterone, you have a body that's like this, therefore you should. And that's what gender is. That is the therefore you should. It is the social idea about what our biology and physical appearance implies about our uh, role in society, in the great human game that we're playing here. Um, now, biological sex, that is something that's a little harder to, to pin down because that's in the realm of the scientific, in the realm of the material. But at the same time, even biological sex is not a binary, it is bimodal. Again, these are ideals that we're dealing with. And scientists have created these ideals of male and female to try to explain animal behavior, particularly with regard to reproduction and the, the species being continued. But, you know, even in the, these are just arbitrary categories that scientists came up with because it works most of the time, not all of the time. Um, and when it fails, uh, it fails hard. Um, you know, I'm going to add this to the, the description because I wasn't 100% sure I was going to talk about this, but maybe I might spend more time in this thing just like dunking on the alt-right and calling them wimps, <laughs> you know, like, because they are, they really are wimps. I, I, a great example actually might be um, <laughs> Augustus Sol Invictus. <laughs> So, like, Augustus Sol Invictus, if those of you who don't know, he's this blood-drinking Nazi, neo-Nazi. Uh, I was involved in a debate with him uh, when he debated my friend Caleb Maupin. And um, you can look this up. The video is out there. Like, it's revolutionary right versus the revolutionary left. Um, and this guy showed up to the debate. And I will never forget this. He showed up, like, with a bunch of... It's like goths LARPing as mobsters. And uh, there were a bunch of Proud Boys there. And, oh, she's the Proud Boys. <laughs> like, 
just these guys and they're like freaking Fred Perry shirts with their little club, <laughs> like being like, we're real men. We're proud boys. And I'm like, yeah, OK. They literally in the stands at one point sang the Disney song Proud of Your Boy. And I'm just sitting there thinking, man, there is no <laughs> like not for nothing. But if you want to convince everybody that you're like a real man, the way to do it is not to call yourself a boy and sing a rejected Disney tune, <laughs> like a freaking show tune. And the, the fact is, is that our society has gone so far off the rails because people like Gavin McGinnis, who's basically just like a burnout alcoholic, um, who's been like kicked out of every job that he's ever done, <laughs> um, can like whip up this mob of lost people. It's almost like, you know, you just draw from Disney. I was doing the, the Gaston pose at the beginning here. Um, what is it? Uh, the, the Pinocchio. In Pinocchio, you've got that guy who's like the, the stagecoach master, and he tricks all of these young boys into joining him in like the like the, like basically like a theme park on like Ple Pleasure Island. That's what it's called, where they get to be like, you know, uh, horrible assholes. And then eventually they all turn into jackasses. Gavin McGinnis is that guy, but like in real life. <laughs> <laughs> and the Proud Boys are a bunch of jackasses. Um, in particular, by the way, with the um, uh, the, the Proud Boys with the uh, punching ritual that they have, where they like have to name breakfast cereals. Like, okay, just as an example, like I'm a Kyokushin Kai. We we train to do bare knuckle fights. Um, I have been in my karate class like doing body conditioning where me and like another black belt is just wailing on me like with uh, without pads just to strengthen my core like to deal with those kinds of hits and like after going through that and going through like when I did my um when I got my when I earned my black belt I did what's called a 15 man kumite where I had to fight 15 opponents in a row, no rest, two minute fights. There were pads, thank God, or I might not be standing here today. Um, and I just had to survive for like, it's one, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my entire life. I would actually uh, call that belt promotion, like, which before that was like three days of intensive karate workouts, like at this retreat that I did with an injured leg. Um, like, I, I would call that the Appalachian Trail in 30 minutes. Um, so like ha coming from that background and, and doing those kinds of fights to watch the Proud Boys like do, 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 naming like Lucky Charms. It's, it's just the dumbest shit you can imagine. So anyway, the, the Proud Boys are there. Uh, at this debate. And um, on top of being at the debate, Augustus Sol Invictus shows up um, and he's got like a knife, like this freaking long that he is left like in a chair, I guess, to try and like um, intimidate Caleb. You know, uh, I have like, okay, I can understand you're coming into New York City and you're a little like worried about getting mugged or something. Like that's not a serious worry in New York City. It's actually really safe, but people still have this kind of Joker 70s idea about the city. When I first came to the city, I carried a knife for, for quite a while um, until I lost it in a sushi restaurant and then realized it was dumb to walk around with a big knife. I wasn't going to use it for anything and I was just being paranoid. Um, so I can understand going into an unfamiliar setting and bringing a, a knife, maybe not like the freaking man killer that he brought, uh, but like I can understand wanting to be armed because you don't know what's going to happen. Maybe Antifa shows up. I, I, I don't know. But what really stuck out to me in this whole thing is how often he kept coming back to violence. And it made me think back to, you know, his... Uh, manifesto is crazy is batshit crazy manifesto that he'd written where he's like he's like i feel like i was born for a great war to lead like the the, the people in a, in a in a great war and if i if a war didn't happen by god i would start it okay this is just a great example of like a guy who 
took like the, the the suggestions of masculinity completely misunderstood them and like tried to apply them to his life in the weirdest craziest way possible um like the idea of just starting a pointless war for no reason like just because you feel that's your destiny that is a classic example of what george carlin called like the male disease it's almost like a guy again it's trying too hard it's like a guy who goes and tries to sleep with as many women as possible because he's told that that's what a man does and so he's going to run out and sleep with as many women as possible and again i don't have a problem with people who sleep around hell i slept around when i was younger um before i met my wife um you know i had a lot of fun doing it um <laughs> like you know sex is it's just great guys i don't I just hot take sex is good <laughs> but like you know at the same time if you're going and like just trying to work up notches on your belt like some kind of freaking psychopath you have missed the point and you'll even see it like in um some of the videos on like the mras and like this the seduction community you see the guys and like the way they talk about sex the way like roosh v talks about it it, it you know, it doesn't seem like any of them actually enjoy the act of it. And what happens is, is that people get caught up in the symbols. First, they get caught up in the symbol of masculinity. If it is, you know, Conan or, or Arnold Schwarzenegger or, you know, um, you know, Geralt now or Superman, they, 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 they see these images and they, they try to imitate them. Uh, to project that I am this masculine man, that I fit society, and therefore hopefully this will uh, ease the um, you know ever encroaching terror <laughs> and anxiety that comes with being a uh, consciousness aware of its own finality uh, in a brutal society that uh, does not make room for those who don't fit. So I can see the, the, this insane urge to fit in really uh kind of gripping people with a kind of madness and driving them to do absolutely insane things um but again it's just not reality like historically men have fought when we've needed to fight and uh what's most important to a traditional man is not his nation you know, it's not, the nation is there because it protects the family. And really, I, your family and your children, if you're talking about patriarchy and what, you know, traditional benevolent good aspects of patriarchy is, is it is the, um, it's you looking out for your children and your neighbors. And then this oftentimes gets exploited by the nation state to then turn it into a kind of loyalty to your people, you know? So we're getting kind of heady and we're getting into symbols. I talked earlier about Marv and I wanted to get back to it because you see it like where um, the character, the, like they're talking about how Marv was had the bad luck to be born into the wrong century and that in another century he would have been a gladiator and you just hear him like they would have tossed him girls like back then. And it, it really gets you thinking like, think about the Conan movie. Um, like the first one, I, by the way, I love, I love Conan. It's deeply reactionary work, but also like sword and sorcery is just super fun. So I don't care. <laughs> um, but like, you know, if you really think about it, like Conan is a slave that fights in like arenas and stuff and pushes a giant wheel, push wheel. <laughs> you heard that on uh, the nostalgia critic years ago when he was, he does a great review of it. I'm sure everyone's seen it. Um, <laughs> he pushes a wheel until he gets super buff. And then he's there in a cage and they're just like, bring in a woman for him to have sex with while everyone watches. And you know, there's just so many guys in the audience who are just like, yeah, that's how you do it. And he quotes supposedly like Genghis Khan with the like Conan, what is best in life? And he's like, um, defeat your enemies, see them driven before you, hear the lamentations of their women. <laughs> um, you know, that competition among men, there, there is definitely a lot of, like, okay, so like when I had my first knockout, um, I was fighting this guy, it felt like 
I would say 15 minutes. It was 45 seconds. Um, and I'm sitting there and it's the second fight that I've done. I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm pretty inexperienced at this point. I was not a black belt at the time. Uh, I had done fights previously because I have a long history of martial arts. But I remember like sitting there and um, I kind of thrown myself into this guy and just decided I screw technique, screw all that. I, this is just going to be a brawl and I'm going to win this since I lost the last one. And uh, I, I'm coming around and like, I remember I'm driving my fist around and like hook punch after hook punch into his side. And, and then I'll, I'll come down with like another hook punch. I, I can't punch him in the face. Unfortunately, I almost got disqualified. That's why I lost my first fight. We don't allow that. So I'm, I'm coming down, I'm coming around with a hook punch and, uh, I start throwing knees. And meanwhile, he's like throwing like lo low kicks into my thighs, which normally hurts like hell but at this point the adrenaline was going through me and like i freaking felt like vegeta like i'm just like yeah dude you can just keep kicking me in that leg all you want i am not stopping and so finally like i lifted up the leg that he had been just nailing over and over and over again and bam right into his solar plexus and i remember just thinking right before i did it i was like oh my god i have never been more tired in my entire life i have no idea how much longer i can keep this up Oh, he's on the ground. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that guy actually fought really well. Like my leg afterwards, uh, deep, deep blue bruise in it. Um, and uh, it took like months to heal. So, you know, he was doing some damage. I just wasn't feeling it. And um, I found a weak spot and went through it. But like that felt good. It, it does feel good when you, as a man, go into a competition and win. I assume it also feels good as a woman to go into a competition and win. I don't, I think like just, it's nice to do something to prove your worth in a difficult situation. And also, by the way, when that's done, like the endorphins are incredible, you know? So the, I, I hit the guy and uh, he collapses and the judges go look at him and they send me off to him like a oh, bad boy. And I'm just like sitting there like, please be knocked out. Please be knocked out. Please be knocked out. Cause I didn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> um, yeah. So, Overall, um, you know, like, I think a lot of the time these Proud Boys, these MRAs, the, these people, they're trying to live up to something that is not them. They're not really expressing their actual soul. They're trying to be what they think society wants them to be. And this can lead to some really, really awful stuff. Like in, in the debate, like you don't see this in the video, but... Um, at, at one point, which you do see in the video, uh, I made fun of a, uh, in, uh, a great unconquered son, Augie, Augustus Sola, because I made fun of him pretty hard. Um, and, uh, you know, what, that was during the Q&A. Um, and uh, what I loved was afterwards, he asked me, like, are you a comedian? And I'm like, ah, you knew that was funny because you asked me if I was a comedian. Um, <laughs> but, uh, like, the people who were there as his followers like the proud boys there was a guy in the audience who tried to start a fight with the guy next to me like and i think he because he confused me with the guy next to me but basically like they had like this this and then the dude like tried to lunge across and attack the dude and he got held back by everybody else um you know thankfully that didn't turn into anything um but again i don't feel like that guy was really like he had no beef with the guy next to me at all what i think he was trying to do was he was trying to get his like get in a serious fight for the movement since uh gavin mcginnis um like told everybody to go and do that and to get in fights because again he's the coachman turning everybody into jackasses um i i think that was him trying to get his degree uh, and just luckily failing at it hard um but again like having that break out into a fight is something ridiculous like if you really want to think about that like let's assume he did get into a fight and he did beat up the guy next to me and i for whatever reason didn't beat that guy up immediately afterwards what does that say about any of the ideas that are being expressed here absolutely nothing uh, but what it does do is it does, it plays that dominance game that men are supposed to play. Uh, I don't really like the dominance game. If you've noticed, um, I have a real dissolution with just the idea of power. I think it kind of comes back to 
me being like a huge fan of Lord of the Rings. And I think you should drop that ring in the volcano every time. <laughs> um, but also like power, it doesn't, it, it feels like it should make your life better, but as you acquire it, it really doesn't. Um, because people, you know, there, there's a great uh, Alan Watts lecture that I would recommend you guys go and listen to. Um, it's called like, what do you get if you only pursue pleasure? In the beginning, he's kind of giving like career advice, but get a little bit further into it. Alan Watts, by the way, total genius. Uh, I would say he's one of the only public intellectuals who's actually worth a damn, like maybe him and Noam Chomsky. And that's about it. Um, you know, like... And Noam Chomsky is nowhere near Alan Watts's level, I should also add. Um, and listening to Alan Watts, like if you're somebody who's like really into Jordan Peterson and you're like, oh, that guy's like, so if, if you like Jordan Peterson, go listen to Alan Watts and you will see what an empty shirt Jordan Peterson actually is. Um, but so as, as we were talking, um, the violence that was attempted at that debate um, was all about, I think, establishing dominance and trying to gain some kind of symbolic victory. Because again, fascists are obsessed with the surface of things. They're obsessed with looking a certain way and being and projecting a certain image. You really see it in like, if you look at the Golden Dawn with their stupid freaking sunglasses, um, it, it's all surface. Inside, uh, there, there, there's no integrity. There's no love. There's no compassion. It's, it's a withered dead. They're, they're all withered and dead inside. Um, and you'll find that the, the more fascists you actually talk to. Um, it's frightening, but not in the way that you would think. Like, not in the way, like, I think they're like, oh, yeah, of course I'm frightening. I'm powerful. It's like, no, you, it's not frightening like that. It's frightening to think of myself being inside your head and experiencing your internal world. Like that's the really, really scary thing about fascism. It's when you engage your compassion for fascists and you realize just what's in there, that emptiness, that evil. Um, so to bring this back to, you know, aspects of gender and sex, as I said, gender and sex are both ideals. Male, a male is an ideal. A female is an ideal. A, um, a man is an ideal, a woman is an ideal. None of them actually exist in nature. Um, as far as biology goes, even like nature, I gotta tell you guys, like those of you who think everything fits into this natural, like male and female category and is all nice and orderly and everything. Nature is a mad scientist and she don't give a crap about what you think. Uh, about like how men and women should be and how males and females should be. You got freaking frogs that change gender. You got clownfish. They, they literally will switch. Um, like if there's no females around, male clownfish will biologically become female and then mate with other males, um, which makes Finding Nemo all kinds of weird if you think about it. <laughs> um there's a really great, oh my God, there's a really great play, by the way, if you get a chance to see it, um, called uh, Triassic Park, uh, the musical. And it's basically like redoing Jurassic Park where all of the dinosaurs are going through like their transitions from female to male. And it's really, really funny because it's, it's Jurassic Park from the, from the point of view of the dinosaurs as a musical. So if you ever get a chance to see it, please go see it. Um, you know, but it, but it deals with a lot of this stuff. Um, so when we're talking about like trans people, um, and you know, there's a lot of research that still has to be done, and I'm by no means an authority on this. Um, but and I will talk more about this in another video, just because this one's getting a little long. Um, but broadly, what you've got is you've got the social expectation, and then you have the actual biology. People seem to think that like the actual biology is immutable and it's always the same, but it's not. Um, because the thing is, is that everyone exists on that spectrum. And in fact, there's a great study. It's been around for a while where, um, you know, it's called uh, why male and female are not enough, the five sexes. And they talk about intersex conditions and they talk about, um, you know, so most people do fit cleanly into the categories that science has created, or as cleanly as you 
can in this obviously not perfectly because again these are ideals and nothing within reality ever matches an ideal um but uh you know folks will be like oh well they're just mutants they're just uh defective and the thing is is that no you think they're defective you think they're defective because again you have confused your own subjective opinion about what humans should look like and be like with what uh, with, with like actual reality. And again, it comes down to this confusion between the subjective and the objective. Um, so, and plus also, by the way, when you're just sitting there and you're like, oh yeah, intersex people, they're mutants. I'm like, you realize you just became the bad guy in the X-Men. <laughs> <laughs> like the, we we know that this is an incorrect position to take with with people so I, I don't know why you're you know getting so triggered that you you, you flip out on that but I, I strongly suspect that we're going to find in the next 20 30 years of research um, that the the trans men and trans women are not only m- psychologically different but i will I, I we're going to find that they're biologically different that from most cis people i think and i think really like in a society like what that means and what that means for gender i don't know smarter people than me can figure that out um but overall i think what's most important here is to believe people when they tell you that they're trans because i mean like why would anyone make that up I mean, and even if they did make that up, because I really do get that at feeling like a lot of people are like, oh, you're you're just lying. You're just trying to get attention. Who would want to get attention that way? <laughs> like with the huge suicide rate with how people are treated, like trans people, out trans people. I, I went to one of the high schools I went to was literally in um, like uh, rural Kentucky. We had one gay kid. I mean, we had way more than that, but we only had more, like one out gay kid at the time. And this this wasn't too long ago. I'm not super old. I mean, I got a little gray here. Um, we had no trans people. And I'm sure there were trans people in there because, you know, they may be as much as one in 100 uh, in our society. Um, but like an out trans person in that community was at, you were at risk of being murdered, like 100%. Um, And you can see it in how often like trans people are murdered. So somebody who just decides to be trans so that they can get attention or like somebody who's like, oh, I just want to, you know, identify so I can sneak into the girls locker room or so I can win at this sport. It's ridiculous. Like it's that wouldn't happen. And if it did happen, the person who did it would be so freaking crazy uh, that we'd have way bigger problems than just them identifying as a different gender. <laughs> so that's not what's happening here, guys. I guarantee, I guarantee you, I guarantee, I guarantee you, that's not what's happening. They're not making it up. Um, and what's happening here is you are getting too attached to the ideal of a man and too attached to the ideal of a woman and to attach the ideal of your little world remaining exactly the way it is. And I'm going to tell you, as a Buddhist, attachment causes suffering. You've got to be open to changing, to um, recognizing new things as new data comes in. And in that time, you know, you've got to be open to changing the idea and your relationship to the idea of masculinity, your own and others, as well as the idea of femininity and finding something, you know, beyond that, Um, whether, you know, it's as a man or a woman or someone who's non-binary or is, you know, potentially infinite number of identities and um, uh, uh, identities and orientations. Like, the thing is, is that, again, we're the only ones here. There's no God above us that we can tell and see. I mean, maybe there is, but there's no evidence. So I haven't seen that. Um, There's no one writing these rules for us. There's just us and nature and figuring out our place. And I think the most important thing that we can all do is to try to be compassionate towards people who don't fit in and try to be as understanding of difference as we can be, so long as that difference is not hostile. You know, so long as it's not hostile or toxic or damaging. 
And I really don't see any evidence for trans uh, people having any kind of damage, you know, beyond the damage that is inflicted upon them by a society that refuses to recognize their validity um, in much the same way as like the damage inflicted upon men who are judged as not being masculine enough or on women who are judged as not being feminine enough, you know, because I mean, that, that shit gets enforced. Like, you know, who knows um, if I had grown up at a different time when um, masculine ideals like boys don't cry. I mean, that messed with me. I'm an emotional guy. Um, and, and like as a child, uh, the very fact that I had to hold back my tears and to keep all of that inside, you know, that's I've got like extra gray hairs just from that probably today. <laughs> um, and a lot of the time, I think like we go back to when I talked about like actual patriarchy and what it was and you know how the, the the actual patriarch of the family was usually deeply unhappy died early uh, a lot of that may have been because of how much he was carrying on his shoulders and how internalized uh internalized he was trying to live up to this ridiculous ideal that just quite frankly isn't even necessarily relevant so you know if you're a guy and you like being a guy like myself and you like doing guy things by all means, go do those guy things. I think that's awesome. If you're uh, looking, if you're a woman and you want to do girly, traditionally girly things, go do those traditionally girly things. If you want to mix and match, go do it. You know, it's more important that we live in a way that is true to ourselves uh, than that we live for others in a uh, very small and toxic way. We live for others in a positive way when we live to uplift, protect, and inspire others uh, and ourselves. Um, and we live in a negative way when we try to live, lessen, when we try to lessen our own uh, souls um, in order to try to fit what we think others want of us because we fear that if they do see who we really are underneath the soul they'll reject us as an artist as somebody who works really hard to always um expose more and more truth about himself as somebody who has a very hard time behaving in a way that i deem false um like I've worked to show who I am to people around me as much as humanly possible. Um, that's why my hair is still like this, you know? That's why I'm running around looking like Thor and Oakenshield or something. You know, I'm communicating with the people around me um, and I'm doing it uh, because I have to. So when I show and what i can say is when you show people who you are who you really are they will accept you not everybody some people will have issues with it um but i can tell you from experience it is better than keeping that shit inside uh so with that uh i'm going to bring this uh video to a close what i'm going to tell everybody is snow white zombie apocalypse deals a lot with gender roles i am the writer of this comic book we have a Kickstarter. We are over ten thousand dollars, and we have three days left to to get in uh, to get it up over twelve, so I can create a second mini comic. Uh, please go check that out. Uh, also, like and subscribe. And uh, you know, if you want to see more content like this or more like some of my other political and philo philosophical videos, leave a comment, leave a like. I'd really help. I'd really like it. And you know, uh, peace out there. <laughs> All right. Catch y'all later.